Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, having looked through the programme for the meeting, Clearly, the relationship between fasting glucose and risk of cause specific death, and it covered all causes of death, but in the context of infections, it indicated that there was a greater than twofold relative risk of death from infections other than pneumonia, and slightly less than two for pneumonias. And it was noted also that this risk increases incrementally as the blood glucose rises above 6 millimoles per litre. In the context of diabetes, we note a number of infections with increased prevalence, a number of infections with higher risk, increased severity, morbidity and mortality, infections which may associate specifically with the presence of diabetic complications, infections which for other reasons may be particularly associated with diabetes and opportunistic infections in general. An example of the risk um, associated with diabetes and poor outcomes, I always like to show this slide which relates back to the SARS epidemic in 2003. Those of you who may remember this emerging disease which affected uh, a number of countries in Asia and in North America and demonstrated that if diabetes was present then the relative risk for either death or intensive care admission with this disease was increased threefold and that threefold increase seems to apply quite generally to a number of infections. Uh, this list I think is one that most of you will already be familiar with and I'm not going to go through it in detail. It's a long list of common infections with an increased incidence in diabetes. Uh, you can read the list quite easily for yourselves from the audience. And it's important to note also that it's not at all uncommon for these infections to actually lead to the diagnosis of diabetes in the first place. There are also um, a long list of organisms which are particularly associated with infections in diabetes and <clears throat> again I think you can read the list for yourselves I will come back to it a little bit later on the mechanisms by which this increase in risk occurs is often very interesting um, it may be associated with alterations in virulence and in some of them it may have a more direct relationship to the actual presence of hyperglycemia in cells uh, for example with candida infections Some examples of more serious infections which can just briefly be alluded to. Tuberculosis I will talk about much more later on. Melioidosis, a condition which is common in this part of India, is interesting because it emphasizes in particular the importance of impaired phagocyte, neutrophil phagocytosis in diabetes. Mucomycosis, again interesting because the biochemistry of the infection relates it particularly to ketoacidosis and is in itself very interesting. Uh, Klebsiella infections are very common in diabetes, have definitely an increased um, prevalence, um, particularly the K1 and K2 serotypes. And again, this relates both to impaired phagocytosis and to the presence of hyperglycemia. Uh, malignant otitis externa is an infection which is almost unique to diabetes and is often lethal. And then emphysematous forms of pyelonephritis, cystitis and cholecystitis, quite rare but almost unique to diabetes, 
and tend to cluster particularly in patients with microangiopathic diabetic complications. It's important to remember also that diabetes and infections can affect each other and operate in both directions. The infections can destabilize diabetic control and increase, improve uh, and influence diabetic emergencies, both high and low blood glucose. And the, on a more chronic setting, the role of inflammation and infection it may be important in the etiology or progression of diabetes, development of complications and risk and so on. Um, both periodontal disease and TB can be highlighted in this particular context. And I've shown in this panel down here, just for your interest, um, data from our own group in Hong Kong showing the development of end-stage renal failure in patients with diabetes who are either hepatitis B virus positive or hepatitis B virus negative. And you can see that the hepatitis B virus positive patients have a much greater uh, or roughly twofold greater rate of running into end-stage renal failure. The problem, of course, is the compromised immune system. The, there is an impaired immune response and impaired wound healing. Uh, it particularly affects the innate immunity. There are abnormalities in many components of the innate immune system and effects upon neutrophils, macrophages, monocytes, and other components of the innate system. These particular problems may be further compounded by abnormalities of microcirculatory function and further compounded still by compromised circulation with either micro or macrovascular disease and also autonomic and somatic neuropathy. If you look at neutrophil function in diabetes, just as an example, you can see that effectively all of the major functions of the neutrophil are impaired. Mobilization, chemotaxis, phagocytosis, adherence, and bactericidal activity. So the innate immune system takes a real hammering with poorly controlled diabetes. On the other hand, uh, adaptive immunity appears to be relatively unaffected and this is of particular importance because it means that there are relatively normal, in most cases anyway, antibody responses to vaccinations. Serum antibody concentrations and responses are generally normal and as a result people with diabetes respond to pneumococcal influenza and other vaccines equally as well as non-diabetic controls. An important practical point to remember. So that's the general overview and moving on now to look at tuberculosis in a bit more detail and this is a, a case which would probably be familiar to many of the clinicians in the audience. A 30 year old man with hopeless diabetes, no regular follow up, poor control, severe hyperglycemia and he presents with a cough and weight loss for four months. He has this chest x-ray and he's smear positive for tuberculosis. A familiar scenario. The association between diabetes and tuberculosis has been known for a very long time, 3,000 years or more. It's been reported in a number of different populations now. If you take the average, the relative risk is about threefold increased, but it's quite variable. And interestingly, it's a Cinderella. It's often unmentioned in tuberculosis strategies which these days very often tend to emphasize HIV infection rather than diabetes. The global risk, you have to remember that tuberculosis is the number one bacteria killer worldwide with about 1.3 million deaths per year. And globally, about 15% of tuberculosis cases are estimated to be attributable to diabetes. So it's a very large number. We have an epidemic of diabetes, which you've heard a lot about already, and I won't go into it again. And we have an epi epidemic of tuberculosis. It's interesting that the epidemic of tuberculosis and the deaths 
a relatively small number are associated with HIV and it's interesting also to note the importance of the Southeast Asian region, including India, in both of these epidemics. In the context of India, this study uh, from uh, a few years ago now has worked out that diabetes accounts for about 15% of TB in India, which correlates with the earlier slide that I've shown you, but with a higher percentage, about 20% of smear positive TB. And in Mexico, the figure is even higher, at 25%. Urban areas are more affected than rural areas, and it's interesting to compare this to an estimate of about 3.4% for the contribution of HIV AIDS to the proportion of adult TB incidence. So it's about five to six fold higher with diabetes. In addition to that, um, the risk, uh, the odds ratio range is given here, is higher in younger people and there is increased risk of new infection after contact exposure and increased risk of reactivation from latency. The age-related association is summarized here on this slide and you can see here if you just look at the upper panel um, from one particular study that the odds ratio increases with decades of age up to a, or an, R, an RR of close to 10 or close to 8 for the under 40s and the under 30s. So there's a tight negative correlation with age, which I think is quite interesting. Diabetes appears to impact tuberculosis at all stages of the infection. The initial contact with TB there's not very much data about that in the context of early onset diabetes, but it's estimated that the chances of going on to latent TB rather than no evidence of infection after contact is roughly doubled in the presence of diabetes. And then if you take this particular group that developed latent TB, the risk of running from latent TB into reactivated active TB is roughly tripled in the context of TB. The mechanism for this is complicated. It's just briefly summarized here. You have an underperforming innate immune response to start with. This leads to a higher burden of tuberculosis, latent TB and then active TB. And aside to this, the, the higher burden sets off a paradoxical hyperreactive but inefficient cell-mediated response, which may be responsible for the increase in cavitatory disease and the increase in bacterial counts. This relates, perhaps, to the radiographic presentation. And tuberculosis patients with diabetes, perhaps in response to that immune response that I mentioned on the last slide, have more lung cavities more extensive parenchymal lesions, okay? And these abnormalities, these worsened abnormalities, are more common in those with poorer glycemic control. So again, it relates to poor control. And of course, it follows from this that cavitatory TB with a high bacilli count may increase the infectivity of tuberculosis to others. So these patients may be a particular risk in terms of disease transmission. The factors involved in tuberculosis risk, I've alluded already um, to the very important aspect of poor glycemic control. There may be additional factors associated with vitamin deficiencies, and there's quite a lot of interesting data relating to vitamin C and D, which may influence both diabetes and tuberculosis. I've talked already about depressed macrophage function, and the other issue is microangiopathic complications which may include microangiopathy in the pulmonary circulation. But the other level to this, of course, is at the socioeconomic and environmental level, uh, lack of care, access to care, and poverty, and so on, overcrowding, urbanization, and the disease is therefore predominantly a problem in 
lower income and middle income countries. In Hong Kong, it's interesting just to note very briefly that if you look at comorbid illness in TB patients and the list of illnesses studied is shown here, you can see that diabetes way outweighs all of the other comorbidities, including out on the right here, HIV infection. So that sets the scene for the disease, but what about outcomes? Well, we know that treatment is not as effective and the main problems are delayed sputum conversion in the context of diabetes, higher relapse rate, higher death rate, more treatment failures, more reinfection, and as I've said already, possibly increased infectivity. So it's a long list which is rather depressing. This particular study summarizes the, uh, the fatality risk and shows that if you look at a number of factors here, diabetes, HIV, renal failure and age, diabetes comes out very strongly as the most important comorbidity associated with fatal TB. The relative risk of death during treatment has been estimated to be approximately 1.9 in a meta-analysis that was done, uh, published a couple of years ago. This increases um, when other, to almost five, when age and other confounding factors are corrected for. There's also a fourfold increased risk of relapse. And um, although there's no clear evidence uh, for either uh, increased risk of recurrence with drug resistant strains, there is one report from Texas suggesting that multiple drug resistant tuberculosis um, is at an increased risk. But that's not always been confirmed. Clinical management, as I've said already, there is a higher risk of failure, death, and relapse. Both conditions, as diabetes and TB, are more difficult to manage in the presence of the other. The optimal strategy in diabetes is not really known. People make a stab at it, but it's not fully worked out, including the relative usage of the various first-line drugs and the duration of therapy. It's important, however, to emphasize that there is a crucial role for good glycemic control, and this could well improve outcomes, but is obviously hampered by a number of issues, um, which I've already alluded to, drug-drug interactions, chronic inflammation, side effects, and um, many other factors which relate to the presence of the diabetic complications. There are a number of drug-related issues. Again, these are briefly summarized on this slide, which is not exhaustive by any means. Uh, rifampicin uh, may increase hepatic metabolism of sulfonylureas and affect their efficacy. Metformin, DPP-4 and GLP-1 drugs are probably okay, but you need to remember that if you've got a severely hypoxic patient, you may be slightly concerned about the use of metformin. Isoniazid can exacerbate hyperglycemia. Diabetes can interfere with the bioavailability of rifampicin and the presence of diabetic complications, particularly things such as autonomic neuropathy with gastroparesis and renal failure, can all affect the usage and dosages of anti-TB drugs. And the toxic effect of some of the first-line anti-TB drugs may add to or exacerbate the other diabetic complications. For example, ethambutol of the eye, isoniazid, and neuropathy. A complicated scenario, potentially. Um, this is an ad hoc recommendation that has been put together by the Centre of Health Protection in Hong Kong uh, in the treatment of tuberculosis with diabetes. They recommend more prolonged treatment um, with a standard regimen of four drugs for first two months, followed by two drugs. They recommend a total treatment duration of nine rather than six months. But this needs further study, and it's not adequately backed up um, by clinical trials. Just to remind you, I showed this list at the beginning. This is the list of microorganisms strongly associated with infections in diabetes. It's the same list again, 
I've just added over here that many of these may actually be on the differential diagnosis of TB, especially pulmonary TB. And just a couple of examples of that. This is the chest X-ray of a patient with melioidosis. Remember that 50% or more of these patients have diabetes. And I think many of us would look at that X-ray and think tuberculosis. Likewise, this lower X-ray, you look at it and you think tuberculosis, but it isn't, it's melioidosis. And likewise, pulmonary mucormycosis. Uh, another one, common, almost entirely restricted to diabetes. You would be forgiven for looking at that chest X-ray and diagnosing tuberculosis. So remember there is a differential diagnosis and remember that you do need a microbiological confirmation. So, just the last topic for the last couple of minutes. What should we do all about this? Firstly, screening. Now, this is a neglected topic in the context of diabetes. It's received a lot of attention in the last couple of years, um, and so it's picking up pace. And there are three issues here. One is screening for active TB in people with diabetes. The second is screening for latent TB in patients with diabetes. And the third is screening for diabetes in patients with TB. Uh, screening for active TB, um, again, this may include targeted symptom screening or chest X-ray, high prevalence areas with microbiological support. The screening for latent TB is a lot more controversial. I'll come back to that in a moment. But it's been assisted recently by the development of interferon gamma release assays as candidate methods, as distinct from the old tuberculin skin test. And I think nowadays most people would recommend that patients with tuberculosis should be screened for diabetes. And now I notice that TB control programs in India, and as well as in the Pacific Island region, but particularly in India, do advocate such screening. Um, just an example of this, uh, uh, this study from 2013 looked at 14,000 patients screened in India um, and the average detected case rate um, for diabetes patients was 828 compared to 106 per 100,000 in the general population. So there was an eightfold increase in the diabetes in, in the TB case finding rate with such screening. And a similar study in China also showed not quite eightfold, but a, a very large difference between the diabetic population and the general population. The screening methods, um, again, this is just a very quick summary. I'm not going through this in detail because time is running out. Symptomatic screening and clinical examination, that's the obvious, easy, cheap route but it has a low sensitivity and specificity and the evidence base is weak. Chest radiography um, with detection of suggestive lesions, that's getting much better. The sensitivity is quite good, specificity is not so good. Again, the evidence base is quite weak. Uh, sputum microscopy smear, medium cost. Sputum culture, this is the gold standard obviously, but it takes up to eight weeks. And then more recently, the development of polymerized chain reaction microbiological uh, techniques for detecting the nucleic acids from tuberculosis, which can also detect rifampicin resistance. This obviously is becoming the, highest, the gold standard. Good sensitivity, good specificity, but expensive, not readily available, and a low throughput. So not of general applicability at this particular time. Screening for latent TB, um, again, this is a subject which is still under investigation, but I just wanted to make the point about the interferon gamma release assays as diagnostic tools. It looks as though the, uh, these will um, become very useful, but of course they cannot distinguish between latent and active TB. So if you have a positive IGRA, then you still need to use uh, another test for excluding um, active TB from latent TB. However, a positive result 
although it may not indicate active TB, a negative result does rule out both active and latent TB, so it's very, very useful. And also these tests are not affected by the BCG vaccination status, unlike the tuberculin test, which is also very useful potentially. And I think this one is an easier no-brainer, screening for diabetes in patients with TB. And again, you can see from these results from uh, the Texas Medico border, uh, this particular group publishing in the WHO bulletin, the prevalence of diabetes among TB patients was 40% in Texas and 36% in Mexico, easily to justify such screening. So in summary, uh, Mr. Chairman, just a couple more slides and I'll finish. Diabetes and TB, threefold increased risk, especially in the young, low-income, middle-income countries and high-prevalence areas. More severe disease, more cavitating, multilobular or extrapulmonary disease, more likely to be smear positive, worse outcomes, worse mortality, delayed sputum conversion time, increased relapse rate, etc. Screening appears justified. The importance of poor glycemic control and diabetes complications is emphasized. Optimal treatment regimes remain controversial and TB needs to be included in strategies. So, final slide, I've deliberately chosen a, a picture of Cinderella from the fairy tale. Cinderella was the poor overlooked sister. I think tuberculosis is the poor overlooked sister in the diabetes world very often. And William Stewart, the US Surgeon General in 1969, made a statement which I'm sure if he was still around he would regret for the rest of his life when he stated, we can close the book on infectious diseases. What I hope to have done in the last 25 minutes is to present you with that book and reopen it. And there's a little box down here which gives you lots and lots of other reasons why we need to be concerned. So thank you for your attention. Thank you no. very much, Professor. We can take some questions.